This is Tommy's Outdoors 111. We said many times that no conservation program can be successful if the needs of local people are not being taken care of first. And this is especially true and especially visible in Africa, where often local indigenous people are struggling in poverty, desperately so. And in those cases, wildlife also suffers. Animals are being poached for bushmeat or for other produce, and habitat is being destroyed, cleared out for pastures and fields and so on. But there is a hope, because if the wildlife has a value, that can be a very useful avenue to lift people of the poverty. A couple of weeks ago, I watched a streaming premiere of the film called Killing the Shepherd. And the film tells, it tells exactly that story. It tells a story of solely people in Zambia trying to lift themselves of the poverty through putting a value on the wildlife they have. Uh, but before that, they need to run a conservation program, essentially, because they see their wildlife being depleted. And um, this is a fantastic film. It is very impactful. And uh, critics are of the same opinion. The film won over 20 major festival awards. Obviously, the link to the film, I uh, link in the description of the show. So go buy a ticket and watch the film. It's a feature-length documentary um, worth every minute and every penny. And so it is my great honor and pleasure to bring you today my conversation with the director of this film, Tom Opry. Tom is a filmmaker, a conservationist, and founder of the Shepherds of Wildlife Society. During our conversation, we talked about many behind the scenes uh, that were happening during making that film. We talked about what made Tom uh, to make a decision to make that film, as well as we talked about the incredible chains of event that were triggered by making that film. And so this is a very interesting conversation, and I am sure you will enjoy it. And before I let you go and listen to this episode, those of you who are watching video version of this podcast on YouTube, notice that I'm wearing a new Tommy's Outdoors t-shirt. And this time, you can have this t-shirt as well. Um, you can go to buymeacoffee.com slash Tommy's Outdoors and obviously support me and buy me a coffee. But those t-shirts will be available there. But if they're not there yet, I'll just leave the comment under uh, this video or send me a message to social media and I can send you uh, one of those t-shirts. So let me know if you want them. And as usual, support the podcast by sharing this episode with your friends and colleagues. This is greatly appreciated. And uh, if you want to go an extra mile, please leave the rating. Leave the rating, write a review. This is a great help for the podcast. And also, do not forget to buy a ticket and watch the film that we're discussing today with its director, Tom Opry. So folks... That's it for this introduction. And now, without any further ado, Shepherds of Wildlife with Tom Opry. Welcome to Tommy's Outdoors. Great to have you. You know, Tommy, it's an absolute pleasure to be out here today. And I hope the weather in Ireland's better than it is in Montana. No, I don't know. It, I, I'm, I'm not sure of that. We just had one storm and it's like wind and rain and wind and rain all the time. <laughs> yeah, well, Montana's not far off that. So we've had more rain than snow lately. And so it's, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. we're waiting for winter. Okay. Will thus, it come? Th thus, I have the, the flannels on today. So, uh -huh. <laughs> not in Africa. So, appreciate you having me on your show today. Well, it's a it's absolute pleasure, and uh, you know, like you're you're probably a first guest. We have like a professional microphone, you all rigged up for that. So it's a uh, it's great. It's great. Listen, Tom. Um, you know, first of all, I I, I gotta say. Uh, congratulations on the film. It was great. It was, you know, I, I just don't want to sound like I'm going to rattle off a cliches about, it, it, I really struggled to find the proper words. You know, I, I was, 
a little bit even angry, I think, after watching this film, and it was so impactful. Uh, t- tell me, like how how you how you come up with the idea of of filming on that subject? Because you, you obviously you're you're your film producer. You 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 know this is your career, and I watch other films that you've done on on the mountain goats on Marco Polo sheep, but then you decided to go in this you know difficult subject of African wildlife. You know, yeah, and that, that's a great question, Tommy. Um, I've been carrying a, a film or a video camera since I was 19. You know, my dad was uh, uh, made films in the late 60s and early 70s and was a, a, a columnist for a major newspaper in the Midwestern United States and also wrote for Outdoor Life and Field and Stream for 30 years. So I kind of grew up around the outdoors a lot, but I worked in the film business and, and I was pretty blessed to have some great opportunities and feature films to documentaries and I even did Shark Week when I was like 24 years of age for Discovery Channel, one of their, their the, the main premiere show that called The Great Shark Hunt. Um, but, you know, I've spent my whole life kind of being a higher gun and going out and making TV commercials and product films for corporations, helping people make millions and millions of dollars. And and uh, I had a show on NBC Sports for about seven years called Eye of the Hunter, and it was a show about uh, adventure and exploration in wildlife conservation. And it was all done first person, present tense. And then in 2015, uh, um, a lion was shot in Zimb- Zimbabwe that was affectionately called by photography, uh, you know, uh, tourism, uh, Cecil the lion. And, and for, for some reason, NBC decided not to run any more field sports programming. So, you know, we kind of looked at this and, and not really being in that outdoor world my whole life. I've been, you know, I've been in the, the regular film business and, and I saw, wow, wait a minute, there's a lot of stuff going on here. And, and it doesn't quite make sense to me because I grew up, you know, I mean, my dad was a union journalist. I mean, we didn't have a lot of money growing up. And so, you know, I, we ate wild game. I mean, I grew up eating venison and ducks and geese and catching salmon in the Great Lakes where I grew up in Michigan. Um, you know, wild turkey and, and grouse, I mean, pheasants, I mean, you know, I mean, it's a, it was incredible food. I don't think I bought my first piece of, 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 uh, store beef until I was probably in my mid twenties wow. and, uh, you know, you gotta go off to college, you know, you have to try to, you know, pinch pennies and make everything work. But, uh, you know, I, I just was really blessed to grow up in a family that believed in, in um, you know, this outdoor ethic of, you know, being able to, to be a part of nature and, and, and being thankful for nature for what she's been able to provide for us. And so uh, that's always been a kind of the, the foundation of my life and working in the film business. And then when Cecil was shot, this TV show we had on NBC, they called us up. Actually, we were in Switzerland working on a project on the Alpine Ibex. Uh, and I got a phone call on my cell phone and I think I was in Grenoble and it was like, Hey, by the way, we love you, but, um, we're not going to air anything of yours next year. <laughs> and I'm like, what do you mean? I got the whole season in the can. But so, the, so basically it was a big eye opener to me. And, you know, I really started to look into what was really going on out in the world when it comes to the perceptions around sustainable use, the North American conservation model, which is based on hunting. And, uh, and I just really started to look at that. Um, I also, I, I, I got married in 2012 to a wonderful woman, Olivia, who is uh, an accomplished huntress herself and, uh, and a lightning rod. She was Mrs. Nebraska, uh, when she worked for the Cabela's family and, and, uh, back in 2003 and she literally was running a, you know, her, you have to have some sort of cause and her cause was, uh, was to promote, uh, the North American conservation model and the hunters part of it. That's the reason why today after the this European steamroller in the 16, 17, and 1800s in North America, where we decimated wildlife stocks and destroyed just umpteen acres of, of habitat for wildlife. Um, you know, hunters have brought it back in North America. And that's why everybody sees deer in their backyard. They see turkeys. I mean, just incredible numbers of animals that come back. And the forest, we have more forest now uh, in the eastern seaboard, you know, trees growing than we had when, when, the, when the original settlers came in. Um, so there's some, and there's some wonderful things that's come. That's the reason why we have all these songbirds coming to feed in our, in our bird feeders in our backyards, because they have wonderful habitat because of this conservation ethos that was initiated back in the turn of the century by folks like Teddy Roosevelt, you know, I mean, forward thinking folks that did some incredible things. So while I'm sitting around here saying, well, what am I going to do next? I was like, you know, let's look into this. And, And I got a phone call from a group of different, uh, 
wildlife conservation groups uh, and uh, and hunting organizations said, hey, we'd like you to come in and talk to our group. We're doing a conservation panel uh, discussion over the course of two days. We're going to be at, the, at a hotel at the airport in Atlanta International Airport, and we've got people coming from all over the world. And so I'm like, oh, okay, cool. He says, well, what do you want me to talk about? He says, well, what, we want you to look into what the perceptions uh, of hunting is by the broader public. And I'm like, okay, cool. So I did a bunch of research and looked in it. I kind of, like I said, I'd already been interested in it, trying to figure out why things were changing in our side of the world. And so I went to this, this conference and it was, you know, it was a who's who of the, you know, the wild sheep foundation and the Rocky mountain elk foundation, the wild turkey foundation and, and the different Boone and Crockett club and different hunting organizations and professional hunting organizations from all over the world, you know, Africa and Europe and, uh, New Zealand and uh, South America. So it was a, you know, a huge, probably two, 250 people there. And, you know, I, my research was, was, was sad to be honest with you, Tommy, because the perceptions of, of hunting is, is, is just you know, by the broader public is, is awful. And, and, and when I looked at this stuff, it was so much as that I, what we saw were there were groups of hunters that were putting things out on social media that, really didn't show respect towards wildlife, you know, the, you know, these kill shots and the blood and the gore and, you know, and, and, and so basically what I tried to explain to these people over the course of an hour and 15 minute presentation was that you all need to clean up your act and you need to figure out what's going on because hunters have lost the mantle that Theodore Roosevelt brought up, you know, ushered in uh, as calling themselves wildlife conservationists. You know, we now have groups that are absolutely diametrically opposed to conservation. And I'll talk about what I think the definition of it is, but these are preservationist groups, you know, Humane Society of the United States, Center for Biological Diversity. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's just, you know, the Born I Free Foundation. Say, yeah, the hunters are like a groups who are opposing conservation. No, not no, well, they're not. But what they've done is they've created situations where, you know, the broader public could, could not understand the perceptions. You know, when I grew up, you know, I was, it, hunting was important to us because it put food on the table and it brought and, and created wonderful family traditions, spending time in the outdoors together. And in and, and, and times I will always remember for all of my life with my family and, you know, my siblings. So it's an incredible experience. But what I watched over four or five decades, you know, I'm now, you know, past 50. And what I watched was hunting and the reasons why we principally did it was more, I would call a biocentric approach. You know, we did it for those traditions. We did it for food. Yeah, we like to get the, you know, the bragging rights for getting the big buck or the big bull or something like that. But what I've seen is this, this morphing uh, an evolution into more what I call a egocentric approach where you see people that, and, it, and it's not all hunters. It's a very small number of hunters. I actually equate it to like the old real estate analogy, you know, 5% of the realtors sell 95% of the real estate and they do it because they're good at it. Well, about 5% of the hunters out there put out about 95% of the stuff that, you know, you really got to question, you know, is it being done for the right reasons or is it being done to sell products? Is it being able to put your ego on display? You know, is it, is it more about having trophies and, and awards and, and, you know, Booners, Boone and Crockett record book stuff, you know? So, and, and so the perception that it's created in the broader public is one that it's about me. It's about the hunter. It's not about the wildlife. It's not about the habitat. And unfortunately, these other groups I mentioned earlier are very adept, very well organized, very well funded, and they have weaponized things like social media. They will take hunters' pictures. You know, I mean, I understand what it takes to go up there on that sheep hunt. I understand what it's like, all the money that you had to save to go on a, a wild lion hunt, you know, or an Argali sheep species in, in one of the stands. But the reality is, is when you're sitting there holding that animal, and you have a big smile or grin on your face, you really, what you look like and what, and what the broader public, now these aren't people that are into hunting or, or against hunting. These are just the regular folks. This is 70 to 80% of the rest of the population in the modern world. But what you look like is, is really no different than an ISIS terrorist in Syria back when they were cutting people's heads off and YouTube was letting them post that stuff on there because people don't have any way to experience or understand or identify with that person. All they see is somebody smiling or laughing or high-fiving and they're holding this dead animal with glazed eyes and tongue hanging out and blood. 
Yeah. I mean, I, I, think about it. I mean, you know, I, even myself, I see things today that I cringe that yeah. sportsmen put out there. And, you know, and so the, I saw all this and I gave this presentation. And afterwards, I, this gentleman walked up to me and uh, he started explaining to me this little story. And his name was Roland Norton. And, you know, so he started telling me a story about this, this chief that knocked on his door. You know, he had an import export business, uh, working in mostly with mining industry there in, in Zambia. It's, uh, copper industry is a, is a major, uh, industry for the country. And, uh, and, but he was also a professional hunter and had been the head of the professional hunter association of Zambia for some years at that time. And so as I listened to him tell the story, I said, Hey, you know what? This is great. Let's talk tomorrow. So the next day, it was after that we were waiting for flights. He had an afternoon flight. I had an afternoon flight. So we sat in the lounge. And for four hours, I took notes as he told me all of the things he was. I mean, he got down to how much he was paying for this. And that. But what it turned out was this incredible, crazy story about this woman chief. You know, and it's, an, you know, they don't have a lot of women chiefs in that part of Africa who's knocking on his door saying, I need you to come help me. My people are starving. And of course, you think, well, where's the government? Well, the government doesn't have the resources. Okay, well, where is the UN? Well, they don't have the resources. Well, where's all these NGOs? He's, you know, save the people things. Well, they're not there either. So this lady's reaching out to the only person. And, and I go, well, why did she reach out, reach out to you? And she goes, well, she said that she'd heard I was an honest man. <laughs> I'm like, okay, that sounds great. So the long and the short of it is, is that I proceeded to say, well, that's an interesting story. I need to go see this from my own two eyes. So the next spring, I flew to Zambia with a photographer named Tony Bynum. Uh, and the two of us went down there and said, okay, let's spend, a, you know, I think we we're there for about 12 days. And let's say, okay, let's see what's going on here. See if there really is a story. And I'll be dang if there wasn't this, in, this really interesting story. Now, we weren't seeing any wildlife. And, and basically what had happened for the last couple decades, um, this area that this tribal group was in, this is the kingdom of Shekabeta, they literally, uh, because of safari hunting bans in 2001 and 2002, and prior to that in 87, kind of ushered in uh, kind of the wholesale slaughter of wildlife because the safari operators weren't on the ground protecting it by hiring game scouts and creating an economic uh, you know, the, the, the money that you need in order to hire these people to work. And this is a very remote, you know, valley, you know, it's, it's doesn't have any infrastructure. There's no seven 11s or McDonald's or Starbucks. There's no grocery stores. Um, these people are subsistence farmers and they're trying to eke out a living in a, in a place that's tough to live in. You know, they're trying to grow maize where, you know, the, the maize is a North American native crop and the soils are not don't have the the, nu the nutrients that they need in order to grow uh, good quality products. So they need a lot of fertilizer and then it needs, it needs a lot of rain and the rain in that part of Africa. Now, uh, the weather patterns seem to be changing. So the, the rainy season doesn't start the same time it does every year, doesn't last as long. So we're dealing with crop failures because of those. Plus, if they do have a positive crop, then they're fighting off baboons and army ants and hippopotamus and, you know, the, the, just the hot, dry weather once, the, you know, sometimes in the middle of the rainy season that kills their crops or, or competes with them for it. So there's all kinds of problems. This is this this is this part that people don't realize, like you said, they, you know, they go to the store and buy food and they don't realize that. You know, you have a three or five ton animal that is literally destroying y your means to survive for next year. It's mm -hmm. it, it it was you know it was like one one of the reasons. Like I said, I was a little bit angry after watching the film because is it you know it portrays like how far we are removed from comprehending, you know, what these people have to deal with. And, and, and it, it was, yeah, I, I'm, I'm stuck for words, really. Yeah, you know, Tommy, this is, you know, the people here in the modern Western world, so Europe, North America, you know, Japan, Korea, um, you know, the South Pacific, you know, these people, when they get up in the morning, I mean, people in our neighbors, us too, we flip a switch and we expect the lights to come on. We don't care where electricity comes from. We don't know. We don't care as long as the lights come on. We walk into the bathroom flush the toilet out of sight, out of mind. The next big decision of the day is that a chai latte or a caramel macchiato. <laughs> That's not how two thirds, two thirds of the rest of the world lives. It's trying to make two ends meet 
trying to make sure that they can feed themselves, feed their children. You know, children get fed last. That's why when the Nortons showed up there in 2015, in late 2015, originally, children were literally on the gr- laying on the ground in their huts, dying of starvation because of, of famine. And so what they ended up doing was cre- working with the chief and working with the community to come up with a, a, an economic plan that would allow for the wildlife to recover. And now what the people had done is, uh, well, when they had these bans on, on safari hunting in Zambia, I mean, literally poachers came in and built entire villages right where the wildlife lived. And they weren't growing any crops. They were doing nothing but overusing uh, and, and literally destroying the local resources, the wildlife. And so to the point where now there's, there's been local extinction events. There used to be rhinos there. The rhinos didn't walk away. They no longer exist. Heart of beast, puku. Puku is kind of like a, you know, it's like a white-tailed deer here in, you know, in North America. They're everywhere, right? Well, puku are the same way there in, in that part of Zambia. There's not a single one. Jeez. They still haven't seen one. So, so there are certain species that were literally become locally extinct. Other species, there was pockets of them that survived. And Roland had actually been in this area and hunted in 1989 on a safari with some clients. And he explained to me that, I mean, there's wildlife everywhere. I mean, they had the big five there, everything, lions and leopards and, and elephants, lots of elephants and, and a fairly decent population of Cape Buffalo. And of course, lots of kudu and other plains game. Uh, so when they went back, when the chief says, hey, come take a look at this, they went and looked at this thing and the wildlife population's obviously been decimated. I mean, when I was there for my first trip, I don't think I saw 10, 15, maybe 20 animals the whole time I was there. Now, this is not the Serengeti. This is not the great migration, you know, corridors, but it is a, a fairly thick Mopani forest uh, within a very rugged country, you know, it's actually a very end of the rift Valley system coming out of Tanzania and into Lawango river, which is its Eastern boundary. Um, and then the Lewin Semfa river runs through the middle of this thing and empties into the Luangwa. And so, you know, it's a special place. There's tons of history and everything, but the people had literally destroyed the wildlife resources. And so now this chief, you know, nobody wanted to come in there and do any, I mean, they hadn't sold, I think, a a license on quota to hunt there in at least two decades. And so this area just literally is a beautiful area, had lots of, you know, lots of trees and lots of great habitat, but almost no animals. And so they came up with this plan where they could protect the wildlife. And of course, that at the time when they got there, I think there were six or eight men that were scouts. And this area is the size of the, like the, you know, the uh, Grand Canyon National Park. It's over a million acres in size. So it's a huge landmass um, with a lot of different topography. Um, but so six or eight guys were patrolling the whole thing when they arrived there. The Nortons arrived. And of course, they didn't have kit. They even went, for, they didn't have firearms at times. They didn't have, um, they, sometimes they didn't even get paid for upwards to a year to do their patrolling. But what the Nortons did was, you know, the, the deal was, is first of all, we need to get these people weaned off of, of eating game. Now there's two types of poaching was going on. There's subsistence poaching, which, you know, people will throw a few snares or they'll have some dogs and let their dogs run the animals. And then when they get tired, they'll spear them with these spears that are tipped with uh, sharpened rebar, steel rebar. Um, and then, you know, they, they obviously have an impact on the wildlife, but was the real impact was the commercial bushmeat gangs. The very uh, organized, very mil- militaristic, um, entire villages they created. And th- it was all about killing anything and everything. There's no such thing as conservation. It's about killing anything and everything to make a buck. And so uh, this area is within a half day's driving distance of Lusaka, the capital. And bushmeat is king in Africa. I mean, it's like Kentucky fried chicken or hot dogs and apple apple pie in, in the United States. It is considered what everybody wants to eat. I mean, it's and, just it's, and it's, is it is it like what portion of that is is poached like illegal? Is it like all of it, or is it like the way of you know some of them is like legal or? It, it's a two billion, according to the UN, it's a two billion dollar black market. Okay, so it's it's not there's no legal sourcing now. Yeah, there are people out there that can sell. You, there is a legal market for game meat, but in this case. This is being trucked out and sent back to Lusaka for for the black for the uh, black market, 
And so, you know, there's no conservation going on. All the wildlife, you know, there's, there's almost no wildlife left. But because Roland had seen this place back in its heyday, and it's still, the, the habitat was still there. It's just, and, and there was, you know, there's more people. I think there's maybe five or 6,000 people in the Shikabeta area itself. And it's, like I said, it's a big area that where they're at right now. But the, uh, the wildlife, you know, Roland's like, hey, you know what? I, maybe we could do something here. But of course, one of the other roadblocks to doing what they were trying to do was that most uh, concession areas in Zambia, they only do short term uh, leases or 10 years. So it's a five or seven year time period. Well, of course, there's there's no quota here. So there's nothing they could bring clients in to hunt. And so it's like, OK, we have to get these people off of this stuff. Uh, you know, we need a new protein source. And they're like, OK, well, you know what? We can invest. I think it was about three hundred and fifty thousand dollars of their own money over the course of three or four years to help try to get this thing turned around. So they built up a plant. They created a plan working with the community and the chief and they invested in a fish farm. Uh, which is today six 30,000 gallon tanks. Each one's 30,000 gallons. They're above ground. Uh, it, you know, it's, it's one of these incredible fish production type factories where you control every facet of that fish's life. And if you have all the necessary resources, you can produce a tank full of 1,500 fish and they're growing tilapia, which is the native fish in that area. And uh, you can grow, you know, a lar- you know, entire tank full in about four to five months. And so they said, well, wow, we could do this. And then when they came up with this is, okay, well, that way we can say, hey, here's a source of protein. You don't need to kill the animals anymore. Um, And then he started hiring people there. And, you know, to date, I think they've got about 160 to 180 people, depending on the time of year, working for them in all their various ventures there. Um, But the cool thing about it is this, there was no hunting. There was no guarantee there would ever be any hunting. They just came in and made a personal family investment. And these are not super ultra rich people. I mean, uh, Roland happened to sell his half of his import export business. uh, I think it was about 2014 or 2015 to his partner and was able to take some of those proceeds to invest in this. It had been a dream of his his whole life to be a safari operator versus just a professional hunter being in control and controlling and and running, uh, you know, an operation in a safari hunting area. And so, you know, the, 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 to get involved in it with the government, it wasn't a whole lot of money, but to do the things that the community needed was a major investment. And that kind of money in that part of Africa is, is a lot of money. And so they started the fish farm. Uh, they started hiring people. They started talking to the local scout or the, you know, they got the, um, some of the folks that were poachers, they started talking to them saying, Hey, you know, you're going to do this. You're going to be in trouble. And mo- you know, 90% of these people were not subsistence poachers. They were commercial bushmeat poachers. They were, you know, making money off of selling animals. Uh, they weren't doing it to feed their family in so much as they were eating the meat. So the long and the short of it is they just created this entire program and, you know, it started to take off and, the people, uh, you know, were getting the, you know, the assistance they needed as far as opportunity. There's no handouts. They weren't, you know, they weren't being given food. They weren't being given seed or fertilizer, which that's another program Roland is initiated for them. But what they were doing is they would get mealy meal if they needed some at cost. And, you know, nobody out there has transportation either. So it's like, you know, how, even if you are successful with growing your crop of corn, what do you do with it with the surplus? Well, you can't take it to market because you don't have a way to do it. So what he ended up, he created this program where he went to the Highland farmers who usually have good crops because they have better rainfall and says, I'll buy your crop at market price. I'll guarantee it. So he would take the excess crop and then he would go down to the lowland farmers who have problems with rainfall, but they're adjacent to water, you know, with the river. And he went ahead and sold them uh, fertilizer and vegetable seeds. And so they started growing vegetable gardens because they could irrigate them if they needed to by hand. And so he guaranteed he would buy their excess uh, crop, surplus crop, and he turned around and sold that to the Highland farmers because they weren't able to grow vegetables up there because they didn't have the water, you know, that they could go ahead and irrigate with. So, so, you know, it it was always a a group, it just seemed like it was one problem after another problem that had to be addressed within the community and trying to figure out ways. And, And it's so complex. I know you've watched the film. It's not a... It's not an easy film to watch for a lot of people, especially if they don't understand what's going on in this part of the world and, and other places like it. Uh, you know, these people when, uh, you know, one of the probably most heartbreaking things for me, since I have three daughters, 
was the fact that if you have a daughter who reaches puberty and you know you most families have seven or eight kids nine kids ten kids and um you know if your daughter reaches puberty and you've you know your crops failed or hippos ate your or hip baboons ate your crop um you know you you can sell your daughter for the equivalent of about enough maize to feed your family for a year about 30 bags and so you know you have this child bride thing i mean these are 12 13 14 year old girls they're obviously being purchased by older men they're usually second or third wives um these older men have are been more successful they've been around that they'll be 10 15 maybe 20 years older yeah that was my question like where 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 these men have uh these these bags of maize or money well the, <laughs> some of them have been successful more than others some of them uh potentially were making their money early on in poaching and may have some of that you know some of the resources still available to them you know because you make lots of money you, they can launder it into other things you know it could be you know into you know hiring more people to make you know bigger fields and do things like that um but yeah so that, that's something i saw there and it was just it was heartbreaking to see that because you know these girls are so young and i talked to some of the nurses at the one clinic that's in shakabetta and they said that there's a big push to stop this because a lot of these girls physically are not mature enough to bear a child and many of them die in their first childbirth so you know being a father of three girls i mean it was just a, just, a, just a really difficult subject matter um but these it, it, it not only was it child brides um there's a real problem with disease there and it's not just hiv there's about 10 percent of the population that has hiv but that's not really the killer the real problem there is sleeping sickness the tetsi it's a tetsi fly area which carries the parasite that carries uh the uh, sleeping sickness uh so i mean we had one of the game scouts uh, that we worked with the first couple of years and you know i got a phone call and he says yeah you know innocent died and, you know we took him to the hospital but he was he, he hadn't treated his sleeping sickness and and it literally had internal organ failure. Um, and this was a 35, 36-year-old guy in the prime of his life. Um, but, is, you know, is, there a, those, is there a way to treat the sleeping sickness? Like how, 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 how did you protect it yourself and your crew? Well, there's really nothing you can do about it. You know, tetsi flies, if they bite you, I mean, it's one of the most excruciating bites. It either hurts like hell or it burns like hell. Uh, and you know, if you have a, if you get a bite and you have a, and it, it swells and you have a red spot on it, there's a good chance that that one, uh, that bite may have transmitted the parasite into you. And you just got to go to the doctor and take some medication for it. Uh, it's not, you know, the other problem they have is malaria. And of course you can take the anti-malaria pills, which we do when we're there. Um, and that's a way to, you know, to, to be proactive so that you don't catch malaria because once you have it, you have it for the rest of your life. Um, so you have those disease issues, but probably one of the other biggest issues I saw there that really hampers the upward mobility of these people uh, is alcoholism. Mm. I, you know, these people are, they're, they're not happy. They don't have food. They're trying to make two ends meet. There's all these social problems that are within the community. And you can buy a, a little bottle of Gentleman Johnny's, which is a cane, uh, pure you know, it's pure cane, but it's a, uh, it's a cane based or sugar based, uh, alcohol. And, uh, you know, you can buy them for about six quacha, which is, uh, I don't know, 50 cents us or 25 cents us. Um, so, I mean, some people have enough money that, you know, they scrabble a lot, but part of the problem is a lot of these guys, when they finally do get a job, I know the Nortons, they ended up hiring about 40 or 50 game scouts. And some of the mother or some of the wives would come and say, Roland, please do not give my husband his paycheck. <laughs> because what they'll spend it on is they'll, they'll, they'll do a bender and get just blitzed, you Gee. know, because they not only can buy alcohol, you know, a few small stores they have there. But the big problem is, is that they make their own their own beer, you know, and so out of millet and, and other grains. And these guys sit around. Sometimes they start drinking at six o'clock in the morning. <laughs> And they don't take care of their wives. They don't take care of their families. There's a gentleman that, that we kept running into that was in this one village. And every time we saw him, he was blitzed, drunk. Yeah. And so, you know, the, you know, at one you time. You imagine that and, once they, once they get, a, get a job and, and, you know, work as a game scout or, or whatever, that will kind of present like this opportunity and they're not well, gonna be not gonna fall into the 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 you know alcoholism because you know i would imagine that alcoholism is you know like you said lack of perspective lack of everything but that here it is like i have a perspective now but it's still 
Yeah. And, and I agree with that in so much though, but it's the same thing we have here. We have very successful people in the Western world that get hooked on it. It's a disease. They get hooked on it. You know, it's just like, you know, the guy who's making millions of dollars is blitzed on cocaine and, and alcohol every weekend. And then eventually it turns into all throughout the week. And then eventually they lose everything. The same thing happens there. It's just in a different level. The very true. And so, yeah, so it's a, it's a real problem there, but you know, it's, what they were able to do, though, is, is, is build up enough of this, you know, by inserting their own money into this thing and starting to build an economy there. They, they wean the people off the wildlife. Um, and one of the in- most interesting stories is that, you know, a lot of the people that were subsistence poaching are the local people that they were working with them and, you know, and helping them and providing them with hammer mills. And they did drill, drill some boreholes, some water wells. Um, they've built a couple of schools or I think three schools now, um, you know, a couple of yeah, clinics. That was, that was incredible story about the schools as well in the film. Like, man. Yeah. Yeah. A great story about that. But what they've been able to do is on the anti-poaching side of things is, um, you know, a lot of these game scouts are related to people that are poaching. So it's like, well, do you want to throw your dad or your uncle or your brother in jail, um, for doing this? And they were like, well, so they came out and started putting, uh, trail cameras around in areas where they knew that the poachers were traveling. They'd put trail cameras out behind some of the villages where people were traveling out and they would get pictures of some of these people, you know, with snares in their hands going out to poach and they would just post the pictures up in the village and the problem went away. Oh, (laughs) nobody started poaching anymore because they dealt with it internally. Like, Hey, these people are help. These people have created opportunity. We have food, we have our jobs, we have, you know, all these things going on don't screw it up kind of thing. So, and, and so that's been a common, common theme throughout a lot of what's gone out there, but you know, it's been fascinating to see it. The wildlife populations, you know, I was there in uh, August, September of last year, finishing up the film and the wildlife populations, you know, instead of seeing, you know, and every year it, it increased exponentially. Now, when you go out in certain areas, you can see literally hundreds and hundreds of animals in a day. And, uh, and it's just amazing to see what happens. And in talking to other scientists out there about the process and what's happening, you know, they say everything is programmed by mother nature to over, overpopulate the carrying capacity in order to survive as a species. And this, this wildlife is certainly doing that. You know, they're seeing lions and there were some, again, they were one of the small populations that survived the onslaught of poaching, but the, the uh, kudu have come back. Uh, the, uh, Impala populations are, I mean, it's sometimes all you see is Impala, you know, fields and fields of Impala and, and herds everywhere. So, um, but so it's been really great to see what the realm, what's changed there. And that's led to the opportunity for them to actually have some legal, uh, hunting quota and they have a limited quota they received. I think the first time was the year before COVID COVID obviously killed everything and caused a huge financial problem for everyone in the community and, and, and the Nortons. And then of course this year, it was the first year they actually, I think they had five or six uh, hunters come and uh, do some very quality uh, game hunts there. And, and from what I understand, that's been a really good positive thing. And, you know, hopefully this thing will just continue to grow and grow and grow. Yeah, fantastic. How long it took to, to make the whole film? Three, four years? You know, I started in uh, spring of 2017 doing our first discovery trip. And then I did a whole bunch of trips over the course of the, uh, that time where till I think I said August, September of 2020. So we've been about 120 days on the ground in country at different times of the year, the rainy season, the dry season, the, the middle of the winter there when it's cool, cooler, and it's never really cool in, in the Luano. Um, it's low, it sits pretty low, only maybe a thousand meters above sea level. So it gets hot year round. Um, but, uh, yeah, it was a matter of that. And then of course, making the film itself was months on end sitting in this edit suite. I'm in here right now here in Montana, oh, it uh, looks good. working on stuff. So yeah, it's, <laughs> uh, it's been a long, long, long process. Yeah. But it was, it was, it was well worthy and, and it, it was well received as well. You, you won like 20 awards yeah. already. Yeah, no, we, um, so the, so the whole process of this is, and, and again, I've been a short form filmmaker. I've done mostly TV commercials and product films and stuff. And, uh, this is really my first feature length documentary film or feature length film period. And, uh, so my learning curve was pretty straight up and down. And so my goal with this was, it was to go out and insert, you know, and get it into the, um, film festival circuit. 
which it's a matter of submitting. You pay little bits, you know, 20, 50 bucks here and there kind of thing. It's submitted into these festivals, trying to figure out which would be the right festivals to submit it. So we did, we submitted to a lot of black heritage, African film festivals, human rights film festivals, those types of festivals, along with a lot of the other regular, just standard film festivals. And uh, we ended up getting 38 film festivals selecting um, the film. There's still, I think, a dozen out there still looking at it. And then uh, we won 20 major awards, which, you know, it's, it's great to be recognized for cinematography and directing and, you know, best documentary feature of the festival and stuff. But really the most important things to me, Tommy, was we won quite a few awards for um, social issues, um, indigenous films, uh, and human rights. And that's really, for me, is what this film became. Is, is It was a story about people. Yeah, it's about hunting. Yeah, it's about wildlife conservation. Uh, but more importantly to me, it, it was about whether the people I featured in this film were going to be able to get a fair shake from, from the modern world. Were they going to benefit? Were they going to realize a benefit? from their hard work in wildlife conservation. That is the anti-poaching efforts. It's the protecting the, the habitat out there from illegal, illegal logging and charcoal production, the deforestation, you know, it's protecting the waterways, you know, from over harvesting the fish and, and uh, illegal gold mining. I mean, these are all kinds of threats that are over the you know, loom over the ridge coming in the Loano Valley every day. But I wanted these people to have a voice because they don't have one. And there are rural indigenous communities all over the world that don't have a voice. And that's really what I'd like to do is be able to give those people a voice so that the rest of the world can understand what their lives are like. And so that's why getting those awards for human rights were so important to me. I mean, will the people of Sheikh Abeda, will Godfrey and Blackson and the other people I featured in this film, will they be able to have food stability in their lives? You know, because they have a job, they can buy food. Will they be able to put their kids in school? Will they have access to health care? These are the things that what these people are getting through this economic model that the Nortons have help facilitate and given them, you know, the first couple rungs up the ladder so they can get out of this, 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 this hole of, of absolute poverty. And, and, and it's a model that's going to have to change. It's, 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 it could as it has the ability, what the, what the Nortons have done with a little tweaking here and there, this could be a model that's used throughout all of Africa and other rural areas. And, and as I mentioned earlier, you know, in Zambia, they only have short-term leases on these lands. So, you know, these operators make these lease uh, bids and they say, we're going to do this and that, we're going to pay this. And whoever gives the best bid to the to national parks, they get the contract to go do the hunting or ecotourism or whatever it is they're doing on the, on the land. But in this case, the Nortons have a 20 year contract with a five-year automatic renewal. So that's a generation. Wow. And the, uh, Royal Council and the community were so happy with what they'd done. They gave them uh, basically title or it's what they have in Zambia is a 99 year lease to about 15 or 20 hectares underneath the fish farm oh, wow. and also in their permanent safari camp. And those are transferable titles. So now they've been able to secure that development. You don't hear about that in Africa. It doesn't exist or if it does, it's very, very few places. And so now you have an economic model where they know that they have the safety and security of knowing that they're going to be there for a long time. And so they can invest that money. So now, you know, these operators have to come in with hundreds of thousands of dollars and they, what they in essence become as part of the community. You know, they, they, they're just like having a, a factory or a business move into your community and say, look, we're going to hire all these people and we're going to get involved in the, the local charities and we're going to go help this and that. And we're going to offer scholarships and stuff. Well, that's exactly what the Nortons do. They have a soft loan program for the women there. Uh, as I mentioned, some of these women come to, to roll and say, don't give my husband his, his salary because he's going to go use it all on booze and, and prostitutes. And, uh, and so he's like, well, Hey, how about we give you a zero interest short-term loan and you start your own business? So I've watched all these little businesses pop up out there around these villages. These ladies are awesome. I mean, they figure out how to sell everything from, you know, clothing and, and personal hygiene things to they're making uh, little, um, they fry up little pieces of bread that they sell kind of like a donut kind of deal. So when you're walking by, you can buy these things. They're selling honey. They're selling dried fish. They sell, they sell uh, chickens. They sell, you know, all kinds of stuff. Even, even the cellular phone cards, you know, you can get a little SIM card when you go to this little eight by eight 
you know, mm -hmm. uh, you know, concrete block. You know, I, I heard that 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 in in some parts of Africa, the 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 uh, phone cell phone credits is almost like an unofficial currency because yeah. people are so um, like ability to connect is so important for, to for again. It, that's I guess it's yet another thing that we taking for granted. You take a phone and you, well, yeah. for them it's so important. It's like almost like a currency. The credits on the on the cards. You know, it was really fascinating over the four years that I was coming back and forth. Of course, I saw change on every trip, and for the most part, it was for the better. Not always, but for the most part. And and, and I'll say, I, I, it was like you know, I'll probably get myself in trouble for saying this, but making this film was like having a relationship, somebody who had bipolar disease. We had huge highs and we had huge lows. And so, but what I, one of the really cool things I saw was, you know, these people live in, in thatch roof mud huts, you know, they, you know, they, they basically put a line of, of tree branch, you know, trees, you know, st um, you know, pieces of tree, they sink them in the ground in a circle. And then they make these, these bricks that they put in between them all. And then on top of it, they put a thatched roof and that's what they live in. Well, each year I came, I'd start to see more and more real brick with steel, you know, with, with metal roofs, with door frames and doors and windows and stuff. It's like, as I went in the Shikibeta, there might've been a, you know, a few government buildings that were that way and maybe the chief's palace. But then it seemed like the next time I went, there was two or three new ones and two or three more over here and two or three over there. And because th these people could now afford to buy some of this because there was money in their local economy. And that was money being brought in by the Nortons. You know, there is some money that comes from some other outside sources. They do have a, a biocarbon sequestration program there where a, a nonprofit in Europe, um, I forget the name of it, but they have actually, they're paying the uh, the community, a, you know, a pretty good chunk of money. I think about $150,000 a year, not to cut any of the trees down in this area, but it's about a third of the size, maybe 20% of the size of the entire Luan, lower Luano Valley. So it's not, you know, a, a, it's not the whole thing, but it's a start. And so, but I've watched this economic change and these little ladies start up these, and you know, these incredible little businesses. And, you know, I mean, and it's like, you know, and their biggest clients, the customers are people who work for Macasa for the Nortons. You know, like I said, they've got hundreds of people working for them now. And so it's just been a, a really cool thing. And, and probably the second biggest thing to me that was interesting besides, uh, you know, the issue for me was, was, uh, after my first trip, I came back and my father-in-law, Dr. Peter Nalos, um, was at our home and he was visiting the kids and he started, he said, well, what were you doing? And I showed him some of the video and there was this uh, foundation. I said, well, they're supposed to build a school here, the Norton's are, to, and the people ran out of money. And so there's a bunch of blocks sitting there and there's a foundation, a monolithic slab, but there's nothing there. And he says, oh, really? Well, you know, I have a nonprofit that builds schools in Africa, don't you? And I'm like, yeah, I, I didn't know. I mean, I, yeah, I'd heard something, whatever. I hadn't, I'd literally, Scout's Honor, I had no idea. And he says, well, I, you know, I've been building, you know, I've got 40 different schools, I think, right now in Ethiopia alone, all in the bush. And, you know, and like 12 years ago, he, had, he was on a hunting trip in Ethiopia, had an epiphany, and he literally said, you know what? I think the Lord's told me. I need to still, I see people that need things. Let me build schools in these rural areas, in these hunting areas and help them. You know, today, African Children's Schools, I think has 60 or 70 schools. We have two orphanages uh, and you know, we've got one in Uganda, but they're in Ethiopia, Uganda um, and uh, South Africa. And now because of this project, he's looking at this thing. He's like, well, how about if I help out with this? And I'm like, okay. So the next day we were on a WhatsApp call with Roland Norton. And saying, okay, what would it take to, to build this school? And so we literally figured it out to the block. And within a week, African Children's School sent 50% of the proceeds to, to build that school, another double classroom block, and school and teachers' uh, residences, and uniforms, and desks, and teaching materials. And that's now evolved into paying for the teachers' salaries, because these aren't government schools. These are out in the bush. And so now we've this 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 whole you know evolutionary process occurred because of me showing someone my film, you know, my video. And so it was like a really humbling, humbling experience to see and feel what's going on. And now when I go back, you know, Roland was telling me the other day that you know, when we built the first school, there I think there was about 80 kids in there, and that's the school that you see in the film. And, you know, it's an open air thatched roof school. I mean, you know, that's and they were basically rotating kids at different ages out of there and they didn't have a real school teacher, just had some, uh, you know, someone in the community, an, an adult that actually had an, some education. 
certainly not certified, not paid to do it or anything. And um, he said that once the school was built, within about a month or two, they didn't have 80 kids there. They had like 380 kids there because kids were coming out of the woodwork. Kids that had never gone to school in their lives were now coming to the school because there was an official, real, serious school right there where they could get a uniform. And that was one of the things they paid for is they provided all that. And so it, it was really cool. And these kids are all learning English, which is the language of, of the financial world. And so the, the opportunities, not only, you know, are these kids getting a chance to learn something, but there are opportunities moving forward and understanding conservation and what has transpired to create these opportunities. They're going to be in a way better position to understand that. But, you know, it's been a real blessing to be able to know that, what little I could provide created so much. And so it, it, it's just awe-inspiring. Fantastic. And, and man, I, I'm, I don't know what to say. Fantastic job. Like, you, you know, like you said, like simple things and they're making such a big difference. Like, I, like what's the... What's the government's reaction to all that? Did, did they get involved in anything or this is just convenient well, so and... Yeah, National Parks and Wildlife is involved a lot, and they're ex super ecstatic about things. I've actually they've they've actually added some additional help for the Nortons by bringing in some of their top notch anti poaching teams, and I've actually been on raids on illegal gold mining and and uh, and other things that they're doing in the area there. So they're 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 putting an effort that well, what they can in, and they're really helping out you know on the peripheries and and when there's you know the the, the poaching at the at the commercial level, the illegal uh, bushmeat poaching. I mean, that's very, very dangerous stuff. I mean, the Nortons actually both Roland and his son, Alistair, who's a full-time professional hunter and partner in all this, um, both have hits out on their lives to be killed. Mm -hmm. Contracts. Just like mafioso, you know, hey, that's... We're that was my it. that was my other question. You know, when I watched the film, was it, was it sketchy at times? Because you guys were going with the cameras into places and you were uh, like literally putting, putting, you know, lapel mics on, uh, on poachers and all this stuff. And, and you go into the village, it was like, mm, that must be, you know, a bunch of white guys with expensive gear, camera gear, all of a sudden shows up there. That surely you guys were, uh, you know, drawing attention to yourselves. Well, you know, and I'll tell you, Tommy, I, I pretty well shot this whole film by myself. I did have some still photographers with me. I was at a film festival, one of the early ones, and the gal goes, well, so tell us about how big was your crew? And I sat there, and you know, and I'm like, well, well for most of the shoots, I, I had this game scout that I taught how to hold my flex fill, and his name is Bright. So he was my grip. Bright was the grip. So that was good for a few laughs at the, the film festivals. But yeah, that's really what it was. I mean, it's I carried a very small, compact uh, film uh, film package, camera package, uh, shooting high super speed prime lenses and, and some pretty fast zooms. Like I said, I've been carrying a camera since I'm 19, so it's I pretty well know what I need to do. Um, but yeah, on, on some of these raids and stuff, I mean, I got a camera light on, it's the middle of the night cause they don't do raids during the day. It's just too dangerous. You know, too many eyes, too many things can happen. And they'd have, they've had some issues with, um, you know, being set up by some of the poachers to, uh, to come in and, and being tipped off on something and then turning in that they're walked into an ambush. <laughs> um, and so it's been real dangerous, but yeah, you know, having a camera light in the middle of the night and I'm thinking, wow, you know, who are they going to start shooting at first? Well, probably me. Yeah. And of course, I'm not wearing a helmet or, you know, this is not, you know, somewhere off doing correspondence work, you know, for a major news agency with, you know, flak jackets on. And Did you have an option so to on, at least have it like a, like a, like a vest to protect yourself? I, I guess, but I, you know, I, I trust the, the game. I've, you know, I've been there for so long and I've gotten to know the game scouts and, and I know their families and, you know, I know everybody in the Nortons and their staff and, you know, the chiefs and everything like that. And they, and, and it's really, you know, yeah, it is dangerous, but at the end of the day, I, I trusted in these folks and knowing that, you know, it was just as dangerous for them as it was for me. And, uh, but you know, life is a little bit different in Africa. You know, they don't think of death as the way we do in, in the Western world. 
And, um, you know, I mean, the, the, the situation where Godfrey, who was the chief game scout in Capanda, you know, the first year that uh, I think 2016, the first full year that Norton's were there is his 11 year old daughter got grabbed by a crocodile on the side of the bank of the of the river while she was washing dishes with her mother. And I had her mother recant to recount to me the entire experience. I mean, it was just like unbelievable to think about a crocodile coming up and killing your child. And, and the reason why the crocodile targeted that child was because it had a snare around its neck and it and it had tightened in and you know because the the poachers put snares up all along the water because everything's got to drink well of course crocodiles come up and they walk around too they're not always in the water and this crocodile had walked through a snare and it wrapped around its neck and it you know it continues to cinch down and it cinched down to the point where it had embedded so deeply into its into its skin into its flesh that it couldn't it had cut off its throat it couldn't feed so it was completely emaciated and it was just looking for easy prey, you know, and it's not that, you know, the Lou and Sunfer River where this area is, is known uh, probably 40 people a year get killed by crocodiles. You know, that's the, kind of the best guesstimate. But this little girl was taken and, and really, you know, what her mother and Godfrey said, you know, it's the poachers that killed my daughter because if the poachers hadn't put that snare out there, my daughter would probably be still alive today. Yeah, and you know, you you said you said Tom that you, you know people are like oh it's a hunting field like it doesn't come across as 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 you know that was one of the things that, that I would like to you know point out that it's not like oh hunting is so great like actually that almost doesn't come up it's in the background like you said you're yeah. focus, you're focusing on the on the social issues and and on 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 human rights and all these people. Um, and, and, and I found it like, you know, very, very good. And that this is in the background, right? There's no way around it that this is like a hunting concession. There's the safari operator and, but it's, it's not like a, you know, smeared all over everybody. Oh, hunting is conservation, right? Because a lot of people tune out in that moment, right? And, and maybe that's a good moment to kind of, uh, switch a little bit to, you know, I, I'm curious about your views. You started, you started in, in, on that, and you started with an in, in infamous Cecil thing. That really screwed up thing big time. But I, you know, I, I think it was, if not that Cecil, there will be an, another Cecil, another lion. I, mean, I, I think there was. Is it because are we so disconnected if what what hunting is, or is it because of social media and and like you said, like people posting crap and and i've you know i totally identify with what you said I, i i look at the photos even here in ireland and uk and 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 sometimes there are people i know i i you know i know them personally and it's like man why did you why did you post it this you know it's not making any so so yeah so i i guess my my it's a very open question but i think you know it's like why why it is happening now and what can be done to to fix that well i you hit really on a, on a key issue here you know every part of the world humans have an impact historically we have and even now i mean regardless if you believe in human cause global warming or anything but if you go to the highest point on the planet mount everest there is human trash everywhere there's used oxygen bottles laying around there's over a hundred dead bodies up there You go to the lowest point of the earth, which is the Marianas Trench in the South Pacific. And I've always said ever since that Fugishama nuclear reactor tsunami deal that there had to be some really bad shit because shit goes downhill. Yeah. Well, sure enough, a few years ago, National Geographic, you know, sponsored an expedition and they sampled the biological creatures in the trench and they've been exposed to greater constant, greater and worse pollutants than the most polluted rivers in China today. I've been to China. It's not pretty. But that is our legacy. That's how we're leaving this planet. To answer your question, why do we have this disconnect? Because really, like I said earlier, we only have all this wildlife here in North America because of guys like Teddy Roosevelt and that conservation ethos that they spawn and said, hey, this is important. Let's take care of it. The reason why we have songbirds and eagles and alligators and deer and turkey and, and pheasants and all these animals living in the United States is because of the conservation that comes through hunting. And conservation, in my definition, is the wise use of a natural resource. It's the good stewardship of a resource. And that's exactly what we've ushered in since the early 1900s in this continent. 
Europe's a little bit different. So in Europe, it's been a land base that's been owned mostly by a very small group of people. And then the other people, the have nots, don't really get a chance to utilize and be stewards of that land. So they don't have that connection. Not like We have it here in North America, but we also have lost that connection with the broader modern civilization here in North America because we have, there's no ability to participate with wildlife as far as eating it unless you're a hunter. You know, back, you know, humans is like I said, bushmeat's a $2 billion black market. Everybody wants it. We had, uh, I had some soccer coaches up here uh, from, the a UK soccer team uh, or the UK soccer club or something comes to the United States and they bring these coaches from the UK to teach kids soccer here in the United States. Well, they brought up one of the guys was from Nigeria, this black guy, young, you know, probably 31, 32 year old guy, super great. Well, because of COVID, nobody could find, they usually stay at somebody's house. Well, my wife said, well, you know, my youngest daughter's a soccer player. So we ended up hosting all three coaches <laughs> for a week. And of course, I took out a picture from some of the stuff that had been sent to me from the game scouts where they had arrested this poacher with a bunch of packages of game meat and his, you know, his homemade shotgun. I said, what is this to this guy, to this UK coach from Nigeria? And he's like, oh, it's bush meat, man. He's not from the countryside. He knew exactly what it was. <laughs> so my point is, is that we've been eating wild game for as long as humans exist. I mean, I, I don't care what your religion is. I don't care, you know, your culture, where you come from. We all can agree on one thing. As long as humans have walked on two feet, we have hunted. That's a fact. Like they say, even if you're president of PETA, your ancestors. <laughs> I, you know, and, and, and don't tell me because you're a vegan, <laughs> you're, you don't have an adverse impact on wildlife. You know, you live in a house, right? Well, that house used to be wildlife habitat. The boards in your house used to be wildlife habitat. I can take you down to the Gulf of Mexico in the United States here where the delta for the Mississippi River is, and I can show you a thousand plus square miles of dead ocean from overloading of nutrients, fertilizers, and herbicides. Mm -hmm. Don't tell me that your corn crops and your wheat crops and this, this, these you know, legumes that are growing that you eat every day don't have an adverse impact on the world because they do. Everybody does. So, but getting back to the United States, part of why we have this, this, this disconnect is because, because of market hunting, you know, then the destruction of these wildlife species in order to utilize them, just like what's going on, what I documented in Africa and Zambia, we enacted laws here in the United States and in Canada. It's called the Lacey Act. I don't know what Canada has, but they probably have a similar one. You can't sell your game animals. You can't sell the meat. So, and they, and they are very, very strict in watching that stuff. You can't even sell a mounted duck and, you know, which is an interstate migratory bird, a mounted duck to somebody in a different state, because as soon as it crosses the state lines, you've now broken federal law. So, but if you want to eat wild game, you have to source it through a hunter. Now there is, you know, the, you know, you say, Hey, we're going to have a, a venison burger or whatever. We're going to have it uh, nine times out of 10 comes from New Zealand red deer that is farm raised. Same thing with the quail that if you're going to have quail in the restaurant or the boar, it's all farm raised. It may be called a quail, but it's still raised in a farm that's been approved by the government. But because of that Lacey Act, we now have created an artificial, you know, we've created this legal network that doesn't allow humans in this part of the world here in the United States to have access to wild game on a regular basis. I understand why we created the law. I understand how good it was at the time. But I also know right now we need to start thinking about how we reconnect our society with nature. And to do that is if you're eating that that burger or you're having that deer steak or you're eating that pheasant breast from a wild animal and you know how it was sourced, it's the most organic, GMO, steroid-free, free-range food you can put in your mouth. I mean, it's incredible. And so we, because we have this law and we have this mindset, you know, because sportsmen will tell you here in the United States, oh, you can't, that'd be terrible if you sold your deer. That'd be terrible. Well, you go to, you go to Sweden and go to the Scandinavian countries. If you shoot a moose, you can sell that moose. They, they sell moose meat and caribou, reindeer meat, which is a, is a national dish for people in, in, in Norwegian, you know, Norway and, and Scandinavian countries. But you could sell that, and that way people have access to it. I don't know what the solution is here in North America, but we have to start thinking about it because, you know, case in point, 
Arby's, which is kind of like a McDonald's competitor fast food restaurant every fall when hunting season starts, has a, a kind of a wild game burger. Hmm. And when, or, you know, sometimes it's duck, sometimes it's, it's venison, which is red deer from New Zealand. These things sell out in a day. They're gone. They can't keep them in stock. They're gone. Everybody wants one. Just like the bushmeat people, you know, the bushmeat being eaten in Africa. Everybody wants it. Just like the, the moose and the caribou the, 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 up in the Scandinavian countries. And, and, and the results from that, like in Scandinavian countries, hunting has a 90-some percent approval rate by the broader public. Even here, we've done the focus group research. Hunting has a 90-plus percent approval rate as long as it's done for consumption. As soon as you throw in the word trophy or safari, all of a sudden it becomes a 97% negative. Yeah. And that's because of the anti-hunting organizations that have weaponized those words and, and, and literally spent billions of dollars of people's money that they thought was going into conservation into these messaging campaigns and this lobbying by a whole bunch of suits and you know attorneys. That's where your money goes. It doesn't go out into the wild. It's not boots on the ground. It's not saving wildlife. It's not saving wild habitat. It's going in the pockets of greedy people that are looking to control things and they're looking to to make more money. That's all they want to do. So you got to think real serious about that. But that's that's where the problem lies as from my perspective here. And I think, you know, at the end of the day, the biggest problem wildlife and wildlife habitat has is us human beings, seven and a half. 8 billion people supposedly on the earth, you know, we're destroying habitat at an alarming rate. And, you know, the reality is, is if we're going to have wildlife, we're going to have to have habitat without one, you don't have the other. And, you know, and without the habitat, we're certainly not going to argue about whether somebody, you know, kills or harvests his animals out of here. You know, one of the interesting things we've got going here in the United States is we have national forests that are, that are literally managed strictly for berry and mushroom production. Why aren't we managing these national forests, which we have millions and millions of acres of national forest land, great wildlife habitat. Why aren't we managing them for the consumption of wildlife? Because what that brings is the protection of the resource, the nurturing and care of the resource. It creates this connection with the resource so that that creates caring about it by the broader public, but it also makes our planet healthier. It creates biodiversity and ensures biodiversity. I love to have wolves. I love grizzly bears, but I understand we have to manage ecosystems. And if we don't manage ecosystems, because we, like I said earlier, we have our finger and thumb over everything. If we aren't good stewards of the land, then we're going to lose it all. And when you take people that don't understand what's going on on the ground, what they don't know what's going on for the people of Sheikh Abeta, and, the, and the, it's because they're ignorant. It's not because they're not, they're stupid or anything. They just don't know. They don't understand. And so that's why making this film and films like this, I mean, I've got six more films in the hopper, hopper that we're looking to do all over the world here in Montana and in British Columbia with, with the first nations people from the tall tans. And I mean, we've just got some really great stories to tell, but the idea is to use that medium of video film. Put it on, you know, online, make it available to people so they can watch it so that they can see this story. Am I biased? Hell yeah. But I, I, I was raised by a father that said, you know, as a journalist said, you know, the very first environmentalist was the hunter. <laughs> and that's true, you know, because I don't want you screwing up my, my, my trout river, my trout stream. I don't want you screwing up my, my, my upland habitat for my birds that I love to watch my bird dog chase, you know, and go around and point and do just wonderful bird dog work. I don't want you to mess up these beautiful woods that have different stages of habitat in it that allows for edge cover for white tailed deer so that we can see, you know, large numbers of deer when we go out. But I also want to see that grizzly bear. But I also know that we have to harvest a certain number of them because everything is programmed in nature to overpopulate the carrying capacity of the land. So if we're going to be good stewards, then we have to manage entire ecosystems, not little bits and pieces. And that's the other problem I'm seeing here. Not only do we have this disconnect because of wildlife uh, not being accessible as a food item for most of these people here in the United States, but we have a situation where politicians are politicizing wildlife conservation in order to gin up the vote. It's a highly controversial subject. It's the killing. You know, I tell you, Western people are afraid of death. Let's face it. They are. They're oh, man, you said it. You said it. That's that's one of my little theories that the, 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 the whole thing about uh, that is used and exploited by, you know, various organizations about it is because we don't have healthy relation to to death to our own death 
And then if we don't have that, then it's like, oh my God, this sweet little deer, right? But this is just the extension of, again, disconnect and not understanding of, you know, how things go in life. <laughs> they're, 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 we, we kind of living like in the denial, right? Don't talk about death. Like, don't, 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 don't even I, tell, right? Tommy, we outsource all our killing. I, I, when I do my presentations, I ask everybody in the room to raise your hand at film festivals, Q&A sessions, wherever it is. Raise your hand if you've ever bought a McDonald's Happy Meal, which here in North America and probably across the world is a pretty prevalent thing that everybody wants to get the toy and give to their kid. Well, so everybody raises their hand. I said, well, let me explain something to you. There's nothing happy about a Happy Meal. Do you understand that? There's nothing happy about a Happy Meal because you paid someone to raise and slaughter an animal to feed your kid. It doesn't matter if it's the cheeseburger or the, or the chicken nuggets. But that's okay because without the death, according to the UN and other sources, of about 80 billion land-based animals and 1.4 trillion water-based animals, humanity ceases to exist. That's what we live off of. That's what we always have lived off of. So why not embrace taking care of the best of the best of it? Wild game. It's the best for us. It's the most healthy. It's the best for the environment. It's the best for global warming because we're not putting a, a domesticated species on the landscape. They found this out in Southern Africa. You know, originally it was all cattle running out there. And now they said, well, if we have kudu out here, then first of all, we don't have to do all the crap we have to do with the cows. We don't have to fight <laughs> all these diseases and all this other crap. And of course, and the meat's way better anyway. So it's just common sense. Do you want this place to be better than we found it? You know, I, I'll admit, I was an Eagle Scout. That's how I was raised, is to leave a place better than we found it. And to me, after helping people for 30 years make millions of dollars in corporate America and abroad, I just want to give back in a way that can change and be a lasting legacy. I want people to understand the things that we're talking about today. I want them to understand that there are replications uh, to every decision they make. You know, for every action, I've been teaching my young kids for every action, there's an equal reaction. That's just the way the world works, guys. And, you know, if we really want to leave this better than we found it, then we need to make sure that we've got clean water, rivers and streams. We've got to make sure we have healthy forests. We have to make sure we have vibrant and biodiverse wildlife populations. And the only people that are doing that and have a historic record and an incredible model are people that are utilizing these resources, hunters. I mean, literally, they may be the last bulk work against the tsunami of billions of humans that will protect these last vestiges of wild and natural places. And if we don't understand that that is so critical to the, to the, to the, to the very well-being of humanity, then we are really going to fuck this up because we're doing it right now. I, I agree. I agree with you on, the, on, on that front that, that, that hunters are like these... <laughs> I almost sometimes feel like, you know, when the hunters are gone, they're gone like with like a predators with their prey, with the animals. Well, they're, they're, they're. But here's like one thing that I, that I need to touch on. Like, uh, obviously, it is not possible to suggest that everybody will be living off the wild game. Right? 100%. The, do we we got to have some level of, of farming, right? I just want to throw it out there because I know that people will just pick up on that. But it's all about finding this balance. And, and it's all about saying like, well, look, there are these other things. And, and especially when you, when you talk about, uh, you know, rural people, indigenous communities. Um, it, this is most infuriating where, where someone sitting in London or New York or whatever have a strong opinions about things they have no idea about. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, and and that's, and so, we've already. I mean, because there are so many humans here on this planet, there. You know, we're not good. You know, I mean, the, the great Peter Beard was a world famous fashion photographer. I think he was married to Cheryl Teague for a while, but um, he was also a hunter, and he had a ranch in in which is now Kenya in East Africa. And uh, you know, he, I'll paraphrase it, but he said, you know, humans, you know, haven't learned how to be good neighbors with the rest of the planet. And that's true. We, we aren't, 
you know, we build our roads wherever we want to. We build our, you know, our, our airports, we build our apartment complexes, we build our cities, we, we, we cut and chop and slash and burn to, to put crops up. And it may not be the best place to put a crop. You know, we, we grow crops that are literally, in some cases, thousands of miles resources away from the people that consume them. Yeah. What they could be done locally sourced. Again, this is about saying, hey, this is not the come all to end all. This isn't going to save the world, but it certainly is going to make it a lot better place for a lot of things to live in, not just only humans. And and we really have a responsibility to our planet to do that. If we're going to be good stewards, if that's what you want to be, then that's the thing. These are the things we need to think about. You don't have to go out and kill an animal. That's not it. But, you know, go buy a duck stamp in, in the United States. It's 25 bucks. That money goes into, into wildlife conservation. Matter of fact, organizations like Ducks Unlimited have raised millions and millions of dollars and protect all kinds of habitat for waterfall. And, and, and what I want to tell you about that is that not only you say, well, I don't go duck hunting. I don't care. Well, wait a minute here. What lives in our duck marshes and our wetlands? All kinds of creatures benefit from that habitat. And you know who the number one benefiter is of, of those habitats and that protection? Us. Because those areas are the places that filter our human drinking water. So without what Ducks and Lemon has done and what sportsmen have done, we may very well have a whole lot less drinking water on this planet, especially here in North America. But that's the idea behind this is that, you know, hey, we care about it. We take care of it and we'll take care of it. And we don't need to demonize these people for it because they want to eat some duck breast or sit in a, in a duck blind when it's, you know, 32 degrees out and sleeting and raining and, and there's waves splashing up against their duck blind and they're freezing their butts off and they might get a duck or two in the next week and they don't care. They just want to be there. What's wrong with that? Because these people are putting their money where their mouth is, you know, what's wrong. And, you know, and one of the things I, I'll, I'd like to really just, I think people need to understand that the hunting of these iconic species of animals, whether it be the lions or golly sheep or elephants or rhinos or any of these things, you know, big elk in North America or a big red deer in, in South, uh, in the South um, Asia, uh, basically in, in uh, New Zealand, I liken it to what I call the rat analogy. You know, everything's got to pay for it. I mean, we have to have money to pay for conservation. You need to pay for protection. And we got to pay for biology and the science in order to manage it properly because everything is about science. But when you have a rat in your house, what do you do to it? I would like to get rid of it. Yeah, you kill it, right? I do. Okay. So now the rat's worth $50,000 US. What are you going to do now? Uh, I think I'm going to take care of it. <laughs> I think you're going to go grow and raise a whole shitload of rats, aren't you? Now, I, <laughs> That's an oversimplification of the situation, but that's really what the reality is. You know, we, we, we talk about these animals and, and, and the scientists will tell you, you can take upwards of 7% of any given population through recreational hunting. And it has no, absolute no negative impact on that population's survivability or its transfer of DNA. None. That's taking into account natural mortality, natural predation, you know, natural, you know, all the things that happen in their lives. So that's what the scientists are telling us. But at the end of the day, this is about us as humans, just like in my film. This is about the ability to benefit for the hard work we do in wildlife conservation. Will these people be able to have access to food? Will they have health care? Will they have you know, kids, your kids getting an education? I mean, that's the question. We all take it for granted. These people are, are fighting for it. And so in this film, you know, there are countries out there here in the United States, in the UK. We've seen it in, in other parts of the world where they want to ban the importation of animal parts. And I don't mean stuff that people are legally consuming. I'm talking about stuff that, that you know, from these recreational tourist hunters. You know, they go out there and they experience this, this safari or this hunt in, in one of the stands or someplace. And they generate this economic... Uh, you know, lifeline to these people in these remote areas. And these are not places 99% of the time where you can put a different sort of economic model in there. There's no photo tourism going on in the water. I mean, nobody's going to, you're going to go down and hang out there for a week and you're going to pay a thousand dollars a day to be there. And you're going to see, you know, maybe five species of animals in the, each day. You might get lucky and see a lion once in a while, but I mean, this is not the Serengeti and the great migration. You're not going to watch crocodiles eating hartebeest. That just doesn't happen. But these areas can sustain limited use through the hunting industry. So, you know, you have to say, okay, 
Is that a bad thing? I don't know. If I were you, I mean, we could go back to, you know, you know, the colonial powers coming into, you know, to these third world countries and saying what they did back, you know, two, three hundred years ago and saying, oh, by the way, you can't do this kind of, you know, and these people actually are getting a chance to do their own hunting, too, in the Luano. Uh, Roland was telling me that national parks and wildlife, because the wildlife had come back so exponentially in population, that they actually gave the community a limited quota for them to hunt. Of course, they don't have any firearms. So the Nordens are saying, hey, you buy your license, which they get, they have a special license they can buy from National Parks and Wildlife because everything is licensed in this area. And then we'll take you out. You pick the animal you want. We'll shoot it and then hand you it and you take possession of it. And so they've been doing that the last two years. Yeah. And so that's, a, you know, it's a great opportunity. I've, I've talked to them about creating a, a pilot program where, you know, these rural communities can have their own hunting season. Yeah. Where just like in North America, there's maybe there's a 10 day, two week period in, in October at the end of the safari season where these people can buy their licenses and they can work with Makasa and go out. And it's a way to teach younger people, maybe get some of the elders involved and maybe end up with a, a festival or a celebration afterwards. And that way, it's a great opportunity to continue to teach these generations about the importance of their wildlife and that conservation of the wildlife and the habitat. So that comes full circle. So they say, Hey, not only are these, you know, these, these Americans and Europeans and other folks coming over here to, to hunt our animals, but we get to hunt them too. And yeah, I don't want a lion, but some American just paid 80 grand and that money doesn't go to, you know, some offshore account in the Panama canal. It gets spent right there in Zambia, you know, and it, and it pays for not only the salaries and the trophy fees and all the things that, that goes on during the safari, but it pays for everything that that safari operator spends over the course of the year living in that country as a resident. It's just like if you were to receive $100,000 there in Ireland, I mean, you know, you're going to use what you can to do. And maybe you're going to buy a new house. Maybe you're going to do a, an addition to your house, or maybe you're going to buy a new car from the salesman down the road, or, you know, maybe you're going to go ahead and, and sponsor a, a soccer team. Okay. That money stays right there. Just like it does anytime we get money in our own homes. And so trying to make out this idea that this is a bunch of terrible people that are ripping off these folks, I got news. I've been there. I've seen it. It's all a fallacy. Um, is there bad actors out there? Oh, yeah, 100%. I'd love to expose them too. But they're the minority, not the majority. And again, at the end of the day, if it's not about these people and their livelihoods, all this is going to go the way of the dodo bird because they're the ones that are taking care of it every day. They have that resource and they also have to make the decision. If you tell them that that iconic species, that lion, that, you know, leopard or sheep or whatever, it is not worth anything, but the kudu is because you can hunt the kudu, then all those other animals are going to be eradicated. Yeah. They will not be on the landscape because they compete with, especially predators. I mean, you know, if these, you know, places like Kenya and other folks were places where they have these domesticated goats and, and, uh, and, uh, cows, I mean, predators eat those things and they do and then so what happens is the locals don't see any value so they poison the carcass now they got cow and that kills not only the lions when they come back to feed on it but it kills everything else from the jackals to, to the vultures that anything else that feeds on it and so you lose huge populations and entire species in, in local areas because you didn't value that or because you thought you knew better than they did and said hey this thing uh, nobody needs to be able to hunt that hands off Let's preserve it. And preservation doesn't work when you have renewable natural resources. And I say renewable, you know, if you got 50,000 elephants, they're going to be more next year, even with, you know, regular mortality. You know, if you got 50,000 kudu, there's going to be a lot more kudu next year, you know, and that's the way, because like I said, everything is programmed to over, look, look at humanity, you know, that's kind of a taboo subject, but there's people everywhere. Yeah, and Tom, you're, you're you know like, it, it. I can tell that you've been there and you and you live and breathe this stuff because you even mentioned st a thing that doesn't come come up often, which is like local people, indigenous people hunting. Uh, I, I I remember this came up uh, when I was discussing uh, elephants in in uh, Botswana. I think that that some of those local people they would like to. You know, they because they even have a different methods. They 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 doing it differently than yeah. you know white hunter. Let's use that term, right? Comes in with a with a big you know four sixteen Rigby and boom, 
right? And that that creates these elephants, this land, landscape of fear, you, whatever you want to call it. They becoming kind of angry on people and so on. But while local people, they were hunting those elephants hundreds of years before. They have a different methods. They would like to do that too. And that was very, you know, that that's that's that speaks to me because, like, yeah, they're there. Why why they not? Uh, use- an elephant feeds a village. <laughs> I can, I've seen it. It happens. I've never personally done anything to hunt them, but. You know, I see that, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's a walking McDonald's for these people. And when you have too many, I mean, I have seen where you have habitat that is inundated with too many elephants and you go to like Botswana today, there's like 140 or 50,000 elephants in that country. It's a semi-arid desert for most of it, except for where they have these riverine systems, these ecosystems. And they, they claim, according to the scientists, there's only a carrying capacity for about 40 or 50,000 elephants. So we see entire, the destruction of, I mean, because a mature elephant can knock down a mature big tree any day of the week. And so they literally go in and, and these areas have turned into deserts, they, they, wastelands, you know, skeletal remains of trees, not a stitch of grass on the ground. And that's because we haven't been good stewards and managed those populations. And there's other issues involved, you know, the encroachment on habitat by humanity for farming or for you know, cities and villages. And, you know, the more people are on the landscape, there's less places for the wildlife to live. So these wildlife continue to get pushed in, in places out there. But like here where I live in Montana, you know, with the grizzly bear is, is kind of like, you know, the big question of the day here. And because grizzly bears were protected from, from hunting in the 1970s and their populations have grown and grown and grown and grown to the point now where they're starting to dissipate and get out of our wilderness areas. And they're moving into areas that we haven't seen them in, in a hundred years, Yeah, literally hunt, you know, tens, if not hundred miles or more away from these areas out in the plains where Lewis and Clark found them in 1803. Cause that's where most of the wildlife was out there in the plains. Cause that's where the food was. And so now we're seeing these grizzly bears out there. I, it's awesome, but also it creates human wildlife conflict. Mm-hmm. And that's another project that we've already started on. We're looking to go to India to tell some stories of some people there and how they're dealing with wildlife. But that is a common component in all of this is that, you know, when you get too many of these animals, I mean, in, in Montana and Idaho and Wyoming every year, there are, I don't dozen or more people that are severely maimed and or killed by grizzly bears. <laughs> the grizzly bears don't care about you. I mean, they're the top dog and they're, they're the, they're the, they're the king, king of the hill. And you know, you get anywhere near them or they, you get to where their food is and they think they don't want you there. They'll run you off. And you know, a grizzly, an adult grizzly bear can literally pick up and roll a, a three or 400 pound stone with one, with one arm and, and paw. I mean, literally can lift it up and push it out of the way. They don't even think about it. One swipe of their claws. And I've seen people, I've interviewed people that have been attacked by grizzlies here in Montana. It's unbelievably nasty what happens to a human being. Yeah. I mean, it's it's just incredibly destructive. I mean, these these animals are immensely powerful. But at the end of the day, you know, when they meet up against that human wildlife wall conflict wall whether it be trains automobiles or or you know government going out and killing these things because someone died or was in a in an altercation with one the wildlife always loses well if we manage that wildlife and we take care of it then the opportunities for the wildlife to lose well we keep the populations where they need to be so we don't have as many car deer collisions or or collisions with trains with with grizzly bears Um, but at the same time, you know, again, we're back to creating that relationship and and appreciation, but it also teaches the animals. I mean, deer understand that when they see humans walking around the woods, they exit stage left here in Montana. (laughs) They get the hell out of here because they know humans are predators. Grizzly bears don't. Yeah. They're not scared of us. They don't care. But if there was some limited hunting and done using science to base everything off of, most probably not only would we raise a shitload of money for wildlife conservation through the tag, the, the hunting tags and licenses and the money that would come from those people besides just paying the government fees, you know, they all got to come here or they're here and they got to buy gasoline and they got to buy ammunition and they got to, you know, buy a hotel room or hire an outfit or whatever. So it cre- creates an economic stimulus there into these areas that don't have a lot, just like in Zambia, but you actually start to to condition these animals. And I did an interview with Dr. Valerius Geis, who uh, passed away, unfortunately, earlier this year, but 80 some years old, he written 23 uh, books on wildlife conservation and thousands of peer reviewed uh, papers. And he's like, Tom, you know, 
back in the 1950s and 60s when he was doing all of his wild sheep, stone sheep uh, research in British Columbia, back then you had trappers in the woods. Um, you had guns. You had They always carried guns when they were out doing research and stuff. And eventually, you know, there was there was people when they were out there, they had guns. And, and when, the, when the grizzly bears interacted with them, you know, sometimes the bears got their butt kicked. But at the end of the day, bears learn can were conditioned to stay away from humans. You can go up to Alaska; they have legal grizzly bear hunting throughout. You know, I mean, throughout their hunting season, and it's a big deal there. Um, and you don't hear of an awful lot of bear attacks besides the the Timothy Treadwells of the world, who are, you know, again ignorant people that don't know anything about wildlife, and they put themselves in a situation which has spawned more Timothy Treadwells, which is again creating human wildlife conflict. Mm-hmm. And as soon as the next bear gets, you know, gets in an altercation, the bear's going to get killed. Yeah. Well, why does a bear have to get killed? There's no value in that. Yeah. You know, why does a human have to get killed? Let's just be good stewards, take care of the land. Let's manage it using science. And at the end of the day, hey, you know, we're going to have a lot more biodiversity and we're going to have a lot healthier environment to live in. There's only winners. Tom, um, listen, it's a fantastic conversation. And uh, once again, congratulations on the on the film, on the success. I wish you every success uh, going forward. Please tell us uh, how we can keep track of, uh, you know, your future endeavors, uh, where we can watch the film. Um, obviously, the, the link to the film is in the description of the show. Uh, but tell us as well how to keep track of all your future projects because I am I am really excited and I can't wait for, for your more production. <laughs> well, I really appreciate time and it's been a great pleasure and an honor to be here today. I- I'll say, folks, I can be found on social media. So I'm on Instagram, uh, T A Opry. It's my I met my kind of the, the name I go by. I have a father who's still alive who is a you know he's an award winning journalist and and I actually am writing a complimentary book or companion book to this film, Killing the Shepherd. Uh, and I've written some articles and I've written articles for a while and I just try to keep myself separate from the old man. We both have the same first name, Tom Opry. So I go by TA, but you can find me on Instagram, pay me on Facebook. Uh, the Shepherds of Wildlife Society, it's also on Twitter, Instagram, uh, kick TikTok, uh, you know, uh, you know, it's uh, Facebook, all that stuff, or, you know, probably a great way to get a hold of us. And if you want to help out or you want to be a part, we got some incredible initiatives going on. We've just kicked off a, a slate of initiatives. We've got an indigenous filmmaker initiative. What we're doing is literally in every location we go, we're finding a young person that we can teach filmmaking school so that when I leave, they can continue to be the voice of their people. Um, I've got a women's empowerment fund. These are all organic, Tommy. They've all come out of this project. And so we have six women working for us full time in the Luano repurposing the snares that the game scouts take out of the bush into bracelets. So every snare bracelet saves an animal, but we're going to raise money not only to help out the Nortons with that soft loan program for the women, but also we're hoping to put together, sell enough bracelets, we're hoping to put together an educational scholarship fund. So some of these women uh, in these third world, you know, very remote places and rural areas can get a chance to get secondary education or maybe even university. Uh, we also have a program uh, for anti-poaching. Uh, we're working with, uh, you know, we, we get requests from people all over. Like, hey, could you help us with this and that? And, okay, well, what's going on here? And so we've actually worked with a couple of different nonprofits. We're working with uh, Veterans for Wildlife, which is a UK-based charity uh, of retired military veterans that will come into these safari areas and work with the operators to help teach and educate and give advanced training uh, on everything from intelligence gathering uh, to first aid in the field for these game scouts. Just an incredible resource. We're also working with Wildlife Protection Solutions, which is a a U.S.-based nonprofit in Colorado that is working on the cutting edge of technology and and providing technology to these folks out in these remote areas so they can figure out what's going on. So like in the Luano, they've, they've sent... Uh, dozens and dozens of trail cameras, including ones that are tied into the cellular network um, and coming with the training that goes with all that. So it's been really good. So then we also have our scientific research. Of course, once we finish this film, a lot of different scientific researchers watched it. We, we ran it by a lot of folks to get their feedback. And of course, they all thought it was awesome. And now some of them come to us, uh, Amy Dickman from the University of Oxford and also working with um, uh, Lion Landscapes, another nonprofit. Uh, Adam 
uh, Hart, Professor Adam Hart from University of Gloucestershire, who's a BBC presenter, they both come to me, hey, can we do some research down in Loano? I'm like, heck yeah, let's figure this out. So now I've been uh, arranged to get them hooked up with the Nortons, and now we're raising some money so that we can get some uh, full ecological review and some emphasis on lions and leopards uh, with GPS tracking and so forth now in the Loano. Obviously, the big thing for us is education. So we've actually been able to take this film and cut it into a 30 minute, uh, very powerful film that we can take into events, to take into meetings with boardrooms, uh, political, uh, you know, we, as a matter of fact, this next week, I'm doing a, a keynote speak with a keynote speaking at, at the uh, Congressional Sportsman's uh, Foundation's annual um, state legislator event in Little Rock, Arkansas, where we're going to show the film and talk to them about these very issues you and I are talking about today. These are people that make decisions. I've got congressmen. We just showed this film earlier this year to the entire upper leadership of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And these aren't the political people. These are the day-to-day -day bureaucrats and saying, here, guys, you need to understand what's going on here because you guys make policy decisions that have can have absolutely adverse effects on these people. But our goal also is to provide that film to other nonprofits that have great conservation education programs that are already established in schools. And then following it up with Zoom calls where I can literally talk to 20 teachers at a time and answer their questions. And again, talking about the things you and I are talking about today. The idea is to get this, this message out to as many folks as we can. And so we need all the help we can to do that. It's about getting the message out. And so folks can go to shepherdsofwildlife.org. They can make a contribution. They can say, hey, I want to be involved. I want to help out. And, you know, you can get a hold of me and I'll definitely find something for you to do. Um, because it's so important right now that we really take this initiative and, and, and change the world. Because if we don't, you know, not only is wildlife going to be on the back end of some bad stuff, but so are humans. And, you know, that's really what this is about. It's like I said earlier, it's about leaving our, our country and our, and our planet better than the way we found it. Tom, thank you very much. I really appreciate your time. Awesome.